The phone rang. Maybe if I ignore it, it'll turn out to just be a bad dream. He thought to himself. The feel of the cool pillow against his face and the heaviness of his eyelids told him it was impossible for his cell phone to be ringing at this moment. Not at this time of night. Andy had spent every last night of this week on the Cupid murder cases in that office. Every night away from his wife that now laid two to three feet away from him. And went to bed without so much as a kiss goodnight. She'd grown used to the fact that he'd always be away at the office late into the night. It'd been happening over the past few months. She had gotten used to going to bed alone. The phone rang again. Now he was sure that it wasn't a dream, unfortunately. Andy reached blindly across the bed, knocking the lamp nearly off the end of the table before he finally laid his hand on the vibrating cell phone. He brought the phone to his face and opened squinted eyes to look at who could be disturbing him at this ungodly hour before tapping the green answer icon on the screen. Yeah, he said without o he said with only a hint of anger seeping into his exhausted voice. The voice on the other end was young and familiar. Jason had been a crime scene investigator for most of the Cupid murders. The kid seemed to have taken a personal interest, which was somewhat helpful for Andy. But his enthusiasm was about to get him punched in the lip if they came in the form of calls at four in the morning. Andy, boys in the lab of new information about the organs at the previous crime scenes. You want in? Jason asked. What time is it? Four. Oh, were you sleeping? Andy sighed at the question. Uh, not anymore. I'll be there in 20. Don't let any of the hearts go bad, okay? A little late for that. Andy ended the call with a soft beep from the phone and dragged his tired body to his feet. Andy scratched his unshaven face to bring some of the blood flow back and wake himself up. It had been a hard few weeks. The case had nearly run cold. No killings. No murders. For exactly 30 days. Then... Suddenly, new bodies turned up. This had to be something. Something big. Andy had pulled his clothes on, turned the handle of the door, and creaked it open just slightly when the voice of his wife caught his ear. Where are you going? Work called. Again, she said with a bit of irritation. Hun, it's important. It's always important, she stated flatly, before rolling over onto her side. He left. Harrison crunched on crackers and cheese whiz in the morgue. The laptop on his desk streamed the first season of I, Zombie from Netflix through headphone cords and blocked out the rest of the world from Harrison's mind. Every few seconds, Harrison would giggle to himself, spray another shot of cheese onto a Ritz cracker, and continue to eat the night away. Jason was waiting behind him for Andy. By the time Andy walked into the morgue, Harrison still hadn't turned around from his show. Jason was relatively sure. He'd forgotten there was a detective waiting to see him at all. Dr. Harrison, Andy said sternly. Harrison giggled, but not in response to Andy. He placed another cracker in his mouth and opened the fridge a few feet away from his desk to put away the cheese. Andy noted the yellow placard that read, For human bodies, not food or drink. Luckily, Harrison caught a glimpse of the detective on his journey to the forbidden fridge and ripped the headphones from his ear. Oh, detective, sorry. Uh, so sorry about that. Harrison hurriedly closed the laptop out of embarrassment and tossed the headphones onto the desk. In a confused rush, he shook the remaining crumbles of crackers onto the floor and extended his hand. And he eyed his hand, then the fridge with the disturbing yellow placard, then Harrison's hand again before finally he met his eyes. Harrison retracted his hand. Uh, uh, Dr. Harrison, Detective McMahon here is to see the lab results you emailed us about? The lab. Oh, right, uh, the lab results. I have those right here. To Detective Andy McMahon's dismay. Harrison reopened the fridge to remove a labeled bag with a human heart. A bag that was sitting right next to the can of cheese he had left uncapped inside. 
Andy held back a gag. Okay, so detectives, this is the heart we found and I pulled from evidence. Looks like a normal human heart? Eh, uh, sure. Nope. Harrison quickly answered. It was 4 a.m. and Andy was getting annoyed. This was clearly showing on his face as Harrison picked up the pace with his explanation. Uh, okay, so the first thing I noted was that this heart matches zero other bodies' DNA. So we're missing a victim somewhere. Yeah, that's my original thought too. And and you're probably right. Uh, we don't have a body that this heart matches. But what's more disturbing is the bruising. Uh, the wear. I mean, look at this thing. At this point, Harrison was holding the bag out to Andy to inspect, which Andy was reluctant to do. He'd seen a lot in his time with the police department, but he never wanted to see these things so extremely close. However, even with his urge to avert his eyes, he could see what Harrison was talking about. The heart looked like it had beaten to nearly not being functional. So? Uh, this could have happened when it was removed from the body, right? Well, yeah, that's a possibility. The guy wasn't too gentle, but this isn't just bruising on the outside from the grip. And it looks like it was, uh, just, you know, like, used to death. I mean, obviously, it's dead, it, it, but it's, it's not a living body. But whatever this guy had been through before his heart was removed, it was some serious trauma. So, these aren't the same like the Cupid murders before. A similar style, a similar removal technique, but something's changed. I see, Doc. I see. Thanks, Doctor. Harrison placed the heart back into the fridge. The ringing of the saw blade was deafening. Sarah's eyes snapped open and she would have lost her voice from the scream that erupted from her mouth if she hadn't been gagged and tied to the large wooden dining room table. She struggled against her restraints. Her mind raced to figure out exactly where she was and how she'd gotten there. She remembered a drink, a smile, charming yellow eyes, and then darkness. Sarah heard a small chuckle from just out of her field of vision and turned her head towards the source of the noise. Immediately, she let forth another heart-wrenching cry and a stream of hot blood ran down her cheek. She had found why the saw was so deafening. The chuckle continued. The man who drugged her continued his walk around the table, admiring his handiwork. She was so easily seduced. She was happy to be taken to his car and back to his place. She was out before they ever reached the front door. The drugs made sure of that. And now, she was laying right where he'd wanted her to be. He had made a table just for the occasion, of course. However, as he smiled down upon her, his yellow eyes digging deeper into her flesh than the table saw ever could have, he couldn't shake the subtle screaming in the back of his head that this was so wrong. He hadn't always been this way. Only weeks before, he'd been a father, a husband. He worked accounting in an office where he had never hurt anyone in his life, save for a scuffle or two in middle school. But something clicked a few weeks back. Something set itself right, or set itself wrong, in his mind, and he realized this is what he wanted to do. He wanted this table. He wanted to fix the saw into it. He wanted to kill his family. And he wanted to do it again. Sarah's cheek felt like it was on fire and she sobbed into the gag. She pressed her face hard into the wood. She wanted to be as far from the saw blades as possible within the restraints, but she felt something touch her, trace the cut along her cheek and dip into it. She cried out again. Sarah forced her eyes open to see the man from the night before, licking the small red stain of blood from his finger. All the while, those hypnotizing eyes and wide smile beamed down at her. She closed her eyes again. He liked the taste of human blood. He could taste the emotion in it, and he could taste when the person had surrendered to death. That was his favorite part. He tasted it now. He could see that she'd stopped struggling. She was just laying there, crying 
and waiting for everything to end. He would grant that wish for her. His fingers wrapped themselves around the front of her face and with little effort eased her to turn her head back to the blade. Well, now she started struggling again. She saw it coming and had second thoughts, but that wouldn't stop him. He wanted the feeling again, the grind of the strain on the blade, lowering its volume, but not enough to mask the muffled scream from Sarah as the blade sliced deep into her face and eventually into her skull. Within a minute, her scream stopped, and he took a moment to breathe in the mist from the saw's work. Oh, he enjoyed this moment. He could almost feel the release of the human spirit from this woman's body. He enjoyed it so much. He didn't realize that he wasn't alone in that house anymore. The creature behind him had seen what he had done. It had known that the change had happened weeks ago. It had known that this man had become a monster. And yet, it took no action to save poor Sarah. It waited for the right moment to get what it needed. It didn't look for justice. And it didn't need justice. Gemberlings only crave hearts. He was shocked when the hand grabbed him from behind and forced him to lean on the table. He was more shocked that the bite of the saw, carving a line through his chest and toward his heart, didn't hurt as much as he thought it would. All the while, he smiled. He knew that this was inevitable, and now, well, now he supposed it was time to go back, though it was fun while it lasted. It threw him to the floor, and he smiled up at it. His yellow eyes seemed to glow in the darkened house, and he made no effort to fight back. He simply watched as its hand reached through the hole that the saw had ripped through his chest and pulled his heart free. The glow from his eyes faded and his heart futilely pumped its last, not realizing it had no blood left to move. So you remember that body we found? No heart, but all the victims were heartless. <laughs> Jason chuckled to himself at the heartless comment as he realized the pun he'd just made. Andy massaged the bridge of his nose between his eyes as he followed Jason past the crime scene tape and into the home of the latest victim. We ruled out that body. No heart left of the scene doesn't fit our killer, Andy said as they entered the gruesome dining room. Andy was not new to murder scenes and immediately started putting together what he was seeing. One woman dead on the table, the table with a saw fashioned to it, likely killed by the saw. She was still tied, half of her face had been cut to nearly clean off. One man dead on the floor, the hole in his chest suggested that he must have been the victim of the organ theft. Andy leaned down to inspect the woman's body further. She was clothed. No other wounds on the body, besides cleaving of her skull, of course. As far as he could assume, her heart still remained within a rib cage. Well then, we have to rule this one out too. No heart, said Jason. Andy, still in his own head, was suddenly jostled loose by the news. No heart? Are you sure? Uh, we've had the place ripped off and the boys are going through, but if we did, we would have found the hairs right here and the heart in the same place. But no, no heart, Jason replied gesturing to the man dead on the floor. Andy turned his attention to the man. He had died with a smile on his face. Who is he? Uh, some scumbag. He owned the house, but uh, get this. We found his wife and kid in the back. Dead? Yeah. And the cuts look like the ones that Jane Doe here has. So you think he did it? Andy let his attention move from the man to the girl and back again, rebuilding the scene on his head. Now, I'm no detective, but if I was, I'd be arresting the guy right now. Uh, you know, if he was alive. Andy chuckled a bit at the joke. It's always a good thing to do at a crime scene. When he was a patrolman, they used to say laughing at the murder scene is what you do to keep yourself sane. And he never really understood it until he became a detective. Laughing at death seemed to be more crazy than staying stone-faced. But after seeing all the death that he had... And he stopped his thought process when he noticed something that he hadn't before. Small indentations in the flesh of the man's chest stood out with a light purple. A bruise was starting to form in the shape of fingers. 
Andy held up his hand to stop Jason from speaking and waved him over to point out his discovery. Well, if someone saw Mr. Homeowner kill his wife and kid, then, then saw him step out with Jane Doe, she might have wanted revenge. Might want to get the photographer to get a picture of this. Yeah, yeah, Mike! Jason called out excited by the potential lead in the Cupid murders. You think this is Cupid? Whoever made these marks? Not even close. No hair, no heart. This isn't Cupid. But we might be onto some sort of, um, copycat. This stuff has been in the news. Understood. You know, you know, this is like what my great granny used to tell me. I think that's what I always thought was cool about Cupid. You know, he's like one of those, um, uh, Grimleys. She used to tell me stories about the thing uh, when I was a kid. It'd, it'd kill people and feed their hearts to this, this master and stuff. A Grimbly. Uh, never heard of it. Nah, it, it doesn't, it doesn't sound right. It's a, it's a, it's a Grim... Grem, uh, gr uh, gem Gemberling, that's it. And well, if, if this isn't Cupid, then it might be worth checking out. I mean, maybe it's a psycho who thinks he's a, a, a Gemberling. Mike the photographer came closer with his digital camera up to his eye and knelt before the poor soul. Jason pointed out the indentions to be sure they were caught in detail before the body was moved to the morgue. But Andy let the thought repeat in his mind. Gimberling. Cries of ecstasy are unmistakable. Renee McMahon knew that. That's why she always kept her voice down when David stayed late. If the neighbors were home from work sooner than her husband, Andy, was, they'd surely start catching on that not all was right in the McMahon household. Tonight, however, it was difficult to keep her voice down. Thankfully, the neighbors didn't hear her. The boy in the street with his dog, yapping at his feet, however, did. Exhausted and out of breath, Renee laid beside her secret lover. David smiled towards the ceiling, and she cuddled up to his side. They didn't talk. Renee didn't care. She didn't want to talk to him anyway. She wasn't sleeping with him for the conversation. Truth be told, she wasn't sure exactly why she was sleeping with him at all. She just wanted... someone. Anyone. And Andy hadn't been that someone in months. The gambling's hand was warm against the cool window. Renee had felt guilty at first, but now... Now this was just her life. It was normal. But tonight felt so different. She had always missed Andy. She promised her heart and life to him after all, but she hadn't thought about him in so long. Why now? The harder the gambling's hand pushed against the window, the more cracks slowly started to spread across the pane. A tear rolled down her cheek, and she reached up to wipe it away. She was sad, and she had no idea why. Renee tried to bury her face in David's chest and hide her pain in physical contact like she always did, but this time, it didn't fade. Crack! A flurry of feathers and glass rained upon the bed, leaving the two screaming in a creature neither of them expected to see standing at the foot of their bed. David was quick to his feet as Renee pulled the sheet to cover herself. Angry eyes burned into her from behind the painted skull on the creature's face. She understood now. She knew what was coming. The gemberling stalked closer to her on the bed, reaching out for her throat. Do you value your heart, it asked. Renee screamed, and its fingers clenched her neck into a vice-like grip. In an instant, the gemberling crashed against the wall and looked toward the attacker with shock. David stood between the gemberling and Renee. The terrified woman came running to his side and hugged her would-be protector. The gemberling was confused. From every man that he'd met, and every man that he'd killed, none had knocked him off his feet. What was this... thing? David smiled at the gambling and pushed Renee back. She fought to stay closer to him, her fear not allowing her to let go. But he wouldn't have it. David pushed harder, fought back, but eventually grew frustrated enough to grab her throat and force her to look him in the eye. 
I trust in his golden-colored eyes, she thought. Right before his elbow met her throat and crushed her windpipe. She fell to the floor, coughing and choking to death. David smiled at the gambling. You set us free, he said with the voices of six. What are you? asked the gambling. David only smiled, drawing closer. His yellow eyes like LED flashlights in the dark. The gambling stood and again spread the wings from out of the flesh of his back and roared fury at the thing in David's skin. David only smiled. I'll never tell, David said, the shadows around him dancing and growing. The gambling found himself not being able to look away from David's eyes. The yellow was nearly blinding and hurt the back of his skull, but still he stared. David only smiled. That's all he had to do. A growl and a sharp pain dug into David's back leg. He looked away from the gambling and down to see the small creature clawing at his thigh. He smiled at it and reached down. The slight relief was all that he needed. The gambling had a hold of David's wrist and with a hard jerk and kick from his leg had severed the man's arm. David never screamed, but he did continue to smile. The gambling didn't end the assault until he was sure. The arm was first to go, but next was the leg, the head, and finally... The gambling held the man's heart. Then, and only then, did the yellow glow fade, and the gambling inspected the organ that he held in his hand. It was not a human heart. The heart was black. It beat in his fist with no blood to pump, and he could sense the aura that radiated from it, one that wanted to hurt others in ways far worse than he was capable. He knew this heart. He crushed the organ in his hand and looked to his small dog still wagging his tail, and another whirlwind of feathers. Both were gone. On the nightstand, the cell phone rang. You've reached the phone of Renee McMahon. I'm too busy to check my cell phone right now, so go ahead and text me <laughs> or leave me a message. Bye. Andy ended the call and put his phone back down on his desk. He didn't know why he bothered calling her at night from the station anymore. She never picked up and he realized a phone call good night wasn't the same as actually being home. Andy leaned back in his chair and massaged the bridge of his nose between his eyes. He told himself, once the case was finished, he'd make a note to take some time off. Take some vacation time, maybe. I did some digging on the web about that stuff my grandma used to talk about. And the voice from behind him. Andy swiveled his chair to find Jason standing in the office doorway. You're really not going to drop this gambling thing, are you? It's a gambling thing, and I know it's out there, but... You have to play all angles, right? Okay, well, what'd you find? Yeah, okay. I found this book written by this two Scottish guys that uh, supposedly traveled all over the world in search of the supernatural back in like uh, the 19th century or something. Uh, it's called The Occult Obscurus, uh, Studies of the Supernatural by Ferguson and Anderson. I found a chapter here where they talk about these uh, gambling creatures saying they encountered a few of the things, even ran into one that played a violin in Ireland. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, there's all kind of uh, details about them in here. Uh, skulls on the face, bones in the body, uh, say they even regenerate. Each one has a task to perform set forth by some dude that thinks it's like a, a vampire or something and some shit about a, a voodoo witch that brings them to life. Anyway. Uh, if any of this shit's true, you might have just stepped in some shit that you can't wash off. The whole conversation was giving Andy another stress migraine. He needed a cigarette, and he needed it now. Yeah, 
I hear you. Might be time for a new pair of shoes. Nah, I'll look up some more if I can find anything. Yeah, you keep digging, Van Helsing. Gunshots. Both officers were cut off from speaking and immediately turned their attention out of the center of the station. Everyone in the room had fallen silent and had turned towards the source of the noise. Some had their hands on their phones, others their hands towards their pistols, but all of them looked afraid. Seconds later, the lights cut off. Yelling and panic broke out from the entire office. The emergency exit lights kicked on and that's when Andy saw him. Harrison, bags in hand at the exit. He was sure of it. Two more bright flashes and shots were fired into the crowd of officers before the door was thrown open and he stepped out. Andy pursued him. In an instant, his hand was on the exit door and it was thrown open. He saw Harrison. The man's frame was unmistakable. And under his arms were the hearts. The two that never matched a body. A hand grabbed at Andy's leg as he was about to make a run after the perpetrator, and the moonlight shining through the doorway revealed a patrolman grasping for help. Blood oozed from the gunshot wound to his stomach, and he judged the situation before kneeling to help his fellow officer. Don't worry. I saw him. We'll get him for this, he said, keeping the officer distracted from his wound until medical help could arrive, and keeping himself distracted from the disturbing smile and the glow of Harrison's eyes that he was trying so desperately to convince himself he didn't see. Hobohart stood before the ashes of his tree. He knew from the moment he looked into David's eyes what he was, but he didn't want to believe that it would have happened. Hobo remembered the fire. This was a full year ago that he had burned that place to the ground. A year ago that he had gotten himself back from the tree. A year of reclaiming hearts every time the moon renewed itself. He walked through the ashes and remembered the Valentine's Day card. The one he kept in his back pocket and fished it back out. As he stared at the words in the drawing, he remembered the pain in his heart. His hand came up to touch his chest and feel the heart of another. Not Cece. That one was long gone, but the heart that was still not his. His heart would be in these ashes, right beside. He stopped walking and looked around. He frantically turned and searched, kicking the ash and dirt, and finally falling to his hands and knees and digging through the ash. Cece. Cece was not there. She should be. Some bone, some fragment that would remind him that she was in that fire and burned with his heart. But all he found were bowls in the ashes were the same bowls that he remembered when he became a barking came from behind him and Hobo knew what was there. She stood perfectly still at the scene of her death. She looked on as her killer knelt in the exact spot that she died. But she didn't hate him for it. She didn't love him either. Cece felt nothing. Hobo turned to see her. The paint on her face matched his and he knew why. Rage built inside of him for what they had done to her, and for what she had done to him. Pain and memory came flooding back, and he stood to face her, both silent, and both sizing each other up. A small ringing in the back of Hobo's mind caused him to squint, and he held his finger to his ear. It was like a ring that he had been ignoring for so long had come back for just an instant, and Cece reacted. In a flash, she was on him, tackling him to the ground and beating him relentlessly with clenched fists. Hobo raised his hands in defense, but after the first blow, he was disoriented. Lost in the kicked up dust and flurry of punches, he was left blind, nearly defenseless, and caught off guard as the fingers of the new gamberling dug into the flesh of his chest. Hobo grasped her wrist to stop her. He pushed back against her from digging deeper, and she pushed with all of her weight to grab at his heart. The ashes settled, and for the first time, clearly their eyes met. His with rage and pain, and he could see in hers the same reflected back. 
She wanted the heart from his body, the one that he'd already given her twice, and he would be damned if he would let her have it again. But in that moment, with the two locked together, each forcing the other apart, he remembered. And so did she. The holes left by Cece's fingers that penetrated the stitching on Hobo's chest leaked warm blood. And Cece, for the first time since her rebirth, remembered. She felt the beating of a feeling heart against her palm. She withdrew. The holes in Hobo's chest began to close. And she stood over him. From the flat of his back, Hobo watched her in confusion. Cece held that same blood-stained hand to her own chest and felt the heart within her beat with the same rhythm. Her eyes closed and she remembered the valentine. She remembered the dog in the alley. She remembered their date. And the beating of this heart, his heart. She remembered him. She screamed as that ringing came back into Hobo's head. She must be hearing it too. It must be inside her head, he thought. It won't let her remember me. Cece ran into the woods. And with little thought and little remorse, Hobo followed her.